Hello, hello, hello. This is Mr. Math, your chess instructor. This video is going to be a bit different than usual. I'm looking to start a new series of videos on this channel called Office Hours, of which this will be the first. Uh, in the series, we'll be using less of a formal lesson structure, uh, and we'll be also less focused on specific uh, instructional topics, but rather I'll be covering interesting chess-related topics, mostly talking about chess games and current events. And as you can tell from the title, this video will be talking about the artificial intelligence called Neuro. I happened into Neuro while browsing chess videos on YouTube, uh, and as far as I can gather, Neuro is an AI made by a programmer called uh, Vettel987, uh, and is designed to be able to stream on Twitch. Fairly recently, uh, Neuro started playing chess, and at the time of recording, She's played against another VTuber, against her programmer, and also against members of her programmer's chat. And as far as I've been told, though I'm not totally sure of this, uh, Nero is not just an already existing bot like Stockfish, but it's actually ground up and learning from its own neural network and using it to play. So in this video, we'll be going over some of Nero's games to identify her style of play, talk about her strengths and her weaknesses. Our first game we're going to go over here is one of her games against another VTuber named Fillion. Nero here played black, Fillion let out with the queen's pawn, and Nero responded with simple developing moves which controlled the center. Now place close attention to Fillion's moves. Unlike Nero, she blocks in her own pieces, doesn't control the center because this knight is off, right? It wants to be here, not here. and waste time by moving her queen. Meanwhile, Nero, on, their, on the other hand, develops extremely regularly, and you might notice this as a sort of reverse London setup. It's called a semi-slav, in fact. And it's an extremely orthodox, extremely regular way of developing. She develops her pieces to the center, castles her king, gets it to safety, and we'll stop here as an uh, end to the opening. Now let's take a look at what both sides have achieved. Who has more developments? Well, most certainly black. Neuro has four pieces out, uh, and Fillion only has three. In terms of central control, all of Neuro's pieces are closer to the center than Fillion's, and in terms of king safety, Neuro has castled and uh, Fillion has not. So, now that her development is finished, Neuro needs to decide what to do in the middle game. With her opponent lagging behind in development, Lacking control of central, central squares, and with the king stuck in the center, the correct plan is to quickly blow up the center to attack white's king. That's exactly what Nero does with c5. This immediately changes the dynamic of the pawn structure from one that's very solid right, and passive, that pyramid structure, to one that's very active and creates a bunch of tension attacking a ton of pawns. She then immediately blows up the center, and then activates another piece. This rook goes to c8, goes to that open file. And now this attacks Fillion's bishop, which is undefended, and also skewers the knight, right? Because the knight is def behind it, and it's attacked by the rook, and you might say, well, it's defended, but it's also attacked a second time by the bishop on f5, the benefits of strong piece activity. So, Fillion needs to find a way to defend both pieces, and she does that with bishop b3, using the bishop to defend the knight. But Nero, of course, continues her assault. She develops her queen now, and attacks the pawn on d4, and also pressures on the b-file. I should note that at this point, Nero has been consistently making top engine moves, and she continues this pattern. Uh, she then advances her knight to an outpost where it cannot be attacked by pawns. And now finally, she doesn't make the top engine moves, but make a fair, makes a fairly reasonable one, and goes for a check on white's king. Now, Fillion here had to play bishop d2 to hold her position together, but instead she plays queen d2, and now, after the queens are traded, the queen is no longer defending the knight, and so Nero gets to convert her opening positional advantage into a whole piece advantage, right? She just straight up wins a knight. She has two knights now, and Fillion only has one. She then continues to play excellently. She doubles her rooks on the open file. She activates her remaining passive piece, which is this knight on d7, by moving it to a central square again, and also trades pieces off while she's ahead. Fillion eventually blunders her rook, moving it to c1, when of course 
There is an X-ray attack on the rook using the rook on c8. And additionally, Nero converts it into a fast checkmate with a nice geometrical structure. The knight, of course, protects the rook. The king is trapped in by its own pawns, and the knight, of course, is defended by the bishop. So in this game, we got to see Nero putting on an absolute clinic in how to play the opening and how to convert the advantage granted by the opening against a player who doesn't properly follow the same opening principles. In fact, I don't even know if I could have done any better, especially once you consider that Nero was spending two to three seconds on each move. This was simply just an excellently played game by Nero. Now, we'll take a look at uh, one of her games against her programmer, Betel. This time, she played white, and she let out with e4 into a fried liver opening, which when played correctly, is bad for white, but there's a lot of traps black can fall into. Vettel evidently didn't know how to play it, as he immediately blunders with knight takes d5. Of course, knight a5 counterattacking this bishop is the correct line here. Uh, Vettel plays knight takes d5, and now this allows Nero to go for a sacrifice. Knight takes f7, king takes f7, and now queen f3 forks the king and the knight. Uh, of course, the only move to protect both while keep getting the king out of danger is going to be king e6. Uh, knight f6 is not possible because of the knight is pinned to the king. So king e6 is played by Vettel. Uh, and now knight c3. Nero develops another piece and attacks the pinned knight. Vettel now plays the best move in the position, and that's knight b4. Uh, this is in contrast to knight e7. Uh, knight b4 is a far more active defense, attacks the c2 pawn, and temporarily at least puts white on the back foot. Now white is still winning. Nero here plays a3, which looks like it makes sense at first, since it attacks the knight that's defending d5. But unfortunately, it just simply overlooks the threats on c2. Of course, better would have been something like queen e4 defending the pawn, or even just castling to get out of the way of the check and develop the rook into play eventually. But Nero plays a3, overlooking knight takes c2. Uh, and... It's, I should mention, it is possible that Nero played this, because two games ago, Nero was in this exact position as black, and Vettel was playing white, and Vettel actually played a3 against her. Uh, but regardless, uh, of course, a3 is a mistake, and Nero seems to replicate this mistake, and now Vettel plays knight takes c2, the king must move, and now Vettel captures the rook. Despite this mistake, Nero actually still has excellent chances of winning. Why? Well, let's think about opening principles. White developed some pieces, has control over the majority of the center, and the king, compared to black's king, is relatively safe. Black, meanwhile, has little control of the center, basically no development. The knight on a1 is trapped, and the knight on d5 is pinned. And their king is most certainly not safe. In fact, this is just about the least safe square you could imagine that the king could legally be on in this position. Uh, now, of course, there is some pin shenanigans here, uh, and white plays knight takes d5, because, of course, that piece was not sufficiently defended at this point um, by black's pieces, and Vettel must step out of the discovery and plays king d6. Now, the most important things for white to do to continue this attack are to open lines, mainly getting rid of this e5 pawn, getting rid of this d2 pawn, so that the rest of the pieces can develop and continue the hunt against Black's king. So the top two moves in this position are d4 and rook e1. And Nero finds d4. Sacrificing this pawn lets the bishop into play quicker. Now bishop f4, moving the bishop, attacking the king. Uh, however, after Vettel moves his king, Nero demonstrates some short-sightedness and plays b4, attacking the king again. And yes, while this move does attack Black ki Black's king, it doesn't help get the rook into play. And without White's rook, this attack isn't going to go anywhere, unfortunately. The best move in the position would have been the extremely killer King d2. Why? Well, if King takes c4, there's rook c1 check. The king would be forced to go to the left. And now it's going to get hunted down on the side of the board after queen d3. And it's going to be checkmated very, very soon. Uh, however, Nero makes a move that doesn't progress. 
in developing her pieces, unfortunately, plays b4 check, going for the short-term attack on the king. But of course, this loses the bishop on c4, and without the assistance of the rook on h1, there just isn't going to be enough left in the tank to finish this attack. So, Nero now plays queen e2 check again, does check the king, but again, it doesn't help develop this piece, and it's going to lose another one. King takes d5, uh, and of course, there aren't enough pieces to finish this attack now. Nero makes a couple more checks of the, of the king, but eventually, she does lose the rest of her pieces, and with it, she does eventually lose, we'll speed it up, the game. So from this game, we see some of the problems in Nero's play. She's very, very aggressive, which is a good thing, and she's willing to give up pieces in order to attack her opponent, which again is a good thing. That is a thing that comes up very often in high-level play. But she is unfortunately too short-sighted in her aggression, and she often plays for simple checks rather than winning by developing her last pieces to create the finishing blow a few turns later. Right, she lacks that sort of future foresight there. So now we've got a good grasp of how Nero plays, her potential strengths and weaknesses, uh, and we get a good idea of how her strength is. Now, a lot of people, when I first found the first video of, first clip of her playing against Fillion, I saw a lot of comments from people who are 900 or 1200 saying, well, I could beat Nero, she makes a lot of blunders, she loses pieces. Well, let's see her in action now against some viewers, two players of relatively higher skill compared to uh, Vettel and Fillion, uh, and let's see how her playstyle can be affected by the game state. Uh, specifically, we'll be focusing on open and closed positions and how she performs in those. So our first game we'll go over is going to be her game against uh, a 1558 rated player on Lychess. Uh, Neuro was playing black, and the viewer was playing white. Uh, Lie Chess, if you're confused, by the way, is the website that it was played on. It's spelled L-I Chess. So we had mostly normal opening moves, uh, d4. And Nero actually makes the first detour just a little bit with bishop b4 check. Uh, this move isn't particularly amazing, as the bishop is eventually just going to get traded off. Uh, and it's going to use two steps right, to trade for a piece that only moved one step. So it's a bit of a waste of time. It was not terrible either. Uh, I do think the move, though, does demonstrate Nero's tendency to go for checks, regardless of their effectiveness, right? So of course, white blocks, and now Nero defends her bishop with the knight. Both sides continue development. Uh, and Nero correctly refrains from capturing until after white wastes a move, trying to force her to capture using a3. Then, after Nero captures, white makes an inferior capture on d2 between the knight and the queen. Of course, the knight captures better as it develops a piece. Uh, white instead recaptures with the queen. And then after d5, waste another turn on a pawn move. Of course, the pawn was already defended by the bishop. There was no need to do this. It would have been a better use of time to simply develop another piece. Again, Nero immediately capitalizes on these opening mistakes. In this case, she centralized, centralizes the knight attacking the queen. However, she then wastes some time trading the knights instead of continuing developments. Uh, as we mentioned, this is a waste of time. She's spending a bunch of turns moving this knight, trading for a knight that only spent one turn moving. Uh, that said, after the trade, she does develop her queen soon after, and then follows it up by immediately cracking the center open. And we saw this in her game against Fillion as well. Uh, notably, this time in doing this, she loses a pawn. The pawn on d5 was not defended, and by moving this e6 pawn away, she does lose this pawn. But what is her idea? She plays queen g6 now. This lines up a pin on g2, and now we see her plan. White continues development, and now she follows up with bishop h3, immediately utilizing this pin. White cannot capture on h3, because of course the king would be in danger. Now, this isn't checkmate quite yet. White still has a bishop on d5. Sorry, I can't draw arrows. Uh, White still has a bishop on d5, defending this g2 pawn. So, how is Nero going to continue? How is Nero going to follow up? Rook d8. 
a great move. Now, this attacks the bishop on d5, and it also pins it to the queen. Now, white's threats, uh, black's threats are a lot more clear, right? The b defending piece from checkmate is now being attacked. White needed to do something to provide a successful defense. There are a couple of tactical options here. One of them would have been queen b3, continuing the defense of the bishop and breaking the pin. And you might be wondering, can't black just sacrifice the rook on the bishop and then take next turn? Well, no, because the queen can capture and the queen also successfully defends g2. So white needed to fight in something of that sort. But instead, white sees all of this pressure and buckles under it. They see that c6 is coming, it's going to take the bishop. They don't find a successful defense. They play bishop f3, just trying to keep the bishop defending the pawn. But of course, now the queen falls. And we have queen, uh, rook takes d1, white recaptures the rook. And now Nero further utilizes this pin, as it means that the bishop actually is not defended. Knight captures f3. And after king h1, she finishes in style. Not queen takes g2, but bishop captures g2, and that is checkmate. So the thing I want to point out this game is that Nero was capable of opening the position very, very quickly. And once the position was open, she was then able to attempt to launch an attack on the opposing king. By contrast, let's see what happens when the position remains closed. Again, Nero was playing black this game. And she's actually playing this time uh, against someone who's about 2,000 rated. So, she interestingly tries what's called a Benoni defense this game with c5, uh, instead of the reverse London that we saw against Fillion. And then she plays e6, but opts not to capture on d5. Now, it's perfectly fine to do this. The idea is to eventually play e5 and lock up the position and create this sort of pawn structure. Now, there are two concepts related to closed positions that are very important here. Firstly, bishops, especially ones standing on the same color as their pawns, are very, very, very useless because their movement options are extremely, extremely limited. Secondly, both sides should look to push pawns on a side of the board to create pawn breaks in the position. Nero plays knight g4, which is a reasonable idea, looking to trade away the dark squared bishop. Now, of course, white is a 2,000 rated player. Uh, of course, they also understand this concept. This bishop is standing on the opposite color of these pawns. So this bishop is better than this bishop. And so, of course, white doesn't trade. He moves it away. Nero's knight is then kicked back with knight e1, creating discovered attack on the knight. And both sides reorganize their pieces. Nero's knight is aiming to support a b5 push, while the viewer's knight is looking to support an f4 push. Here, though, the viewer decides to be a little defensive proactively and plays a4, clamping down on the b5 square. Of course, in order to continue, Nero plays a6, supporting that b5 square, but the, Nero plays, uh, the viewer plays a5, and now Nero continues to try and play b5, which would be the best move, if not for a very important special rule, of course, and that's en passant. And now, white wins a pawn, and gets to open up the queen side for themselves, leaving Nero with few options. We have, of course, Nero must move the knight away, and then there's an exchange of pawns, b7, rook b8, rook captures, rook captures. Uh, and white begins to stack up their pieces on the queen side. Here, though, we see Nero's limitations in a close position. She can't directly attack the opposing king, and like most actual chess players, when she doesn't have a plan, she just ends up shuffling aimlessly, and she plays bishop c8, which doesn't really accomplish anything. Uh, rook a8 pins the bishop, and then she tries to be active, moves the queen out, doubles up with the rook, uh, but of course, this blunders the bishop. And so white captures the bishop for free. Now, white reorganizes again. There's an exchange of rooks, and white prepares to play 
again, F4 on the other side of the board. After some trades, now Nero is the one on defense. And the queen and rook do a great job of threatening her king. White relentlessly pushes forward, and now the viewer finds a series of top engine moves to continue and close out the game. E5 breaks open the center, continuing to activate the pieces. Knight b5 chokes out Nero's remaining counterplay. d3 also accomplishes the same, and more importantly, sets up bishop f3, now that this diagonal is open, in order to activate white's last remaining piece that wasn't activated. And now d7 tactically finishes Nero off. Now, of course, the knight cannot capture because there would be checkmate, and it is pinned to the f7 pawn. And Nero's knight is attacked. No matter where it jumps, it would be effectively unprotected. So let's say knight c7. Now, why is this unprotected? Well, there is now a discovery along this diagonal. And for example, now after knight g6 check, black must respond to the check. And then black is going to lose the queen. Nero is going to lose her queen in the situation. And white can make another one. So Nero sees this. And instead opts, instead of losing the queen and permitting promotion, she decides to sacrifice the queen for the pawn to stop white from promoting. But of course, that's going to be uh, basically a concession here of defeat. And again, white continues to find spectacular, amazing top engine moves. After captures, captures. Of course, there's no checkmate threat now. Threat now but bishop c6 it initially looks like it puts the bishop in danger, but it doesn't. It threatens checkmate, and not only does it re-threaten checkmate, it also has the idea of cutting black's rook off from intercepting. So an amazing game out of white here. Top engine move after top engine move. Uh, and of course, Nero is forced to give up more material. Bishop captures e8, forced to trade off more pieces, and white eventually gets in into the position. The rook is sacrificed, and white hunts the king down. So, let's summarize what we know. Nero plays reasonably well. Her aggressive style and willingness to sacrifice pieces to pressure the enemy king give her an edge against players who aren't careful. However, her exception of this, her execution of this, sorry, is occasionally lacking, and she sometimes chases simple one-turn checks in lieu of long-run positional advantages. Additionally, this playstyle, as we've seen in this game, leaves her with not much to do in close positions where it's difficult to directly attack the king, which can cause her tendency to sacrifice to turn into a tendency to blunder. Uh, all in all, assuming Nero is a Nero network and not just a mid-level stockfish bot, uh, Nero shows great potential to develop into an extremely tactical, extremely aggressive chess bot player. Uh, and as of current, I would estimate her strength to be Nero USCF official rating of about 1500, which translates to uh, what is pretty close to her current light chess rating, it would be around an 1800 light chess. Uh, and I hope this video is insightful. If you're looking to improve your chess like Neuro currently is with her neural network, feel free to take a look at any of the lectures posted on this channel. And I'll see you all next video. Thank you all for watching.